Hi everybody, we're so glad that you're here today for worship on Transfiguration Sunday. We read these texts that show Jesus on the mountaintop with Peter and James and John. He's transfigured in a great cloud and a voice from heaven cries out, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. It's an occasion for us to remember that we each are delightful in God's own sight, for we have been created in God's own image as Christ Jesus was created in God's image. It's also an invitation for us to see the image of Christ in the faces of our neighbors. So, in our worship today, I hope that you will be reminded of God's faithfulness. I hope you will remember your belovedness. At United Church of Chapel Hill, we seek to be a place of belonging for all God's children. So however you are joining us in worship today, wherever you might be, uh, I hope that you remember that you belong here, that you belong in God's own heart. This coming Wednesday, we'll commence the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday, uh, one opportunity to participate in worship digitally and two opportunities to participate in an Ash Wednesday observance in person. Come to the church building at 1230 in the afternoon 
or at 5.30 in the evening for an imposition of ashes. We'll be doing this safely. Please remember to bring your mask. Don't expect any physical contact, but we will be sharing ashes with one another. And you'll see how it works when you arrive that day at 12.30 or at 5.30. I'd love for you to come and experience this beginning to the season of Lent. If you're unable to be present at either of those times on Ash Wednesday, a digital service of worship will premiere here on Facebook at 8 p.m. on the evening of Ash Wednesday. So come along. It's your first opportunity to join us for worship and for spiritual practices here in the season of Lent. I hope that you will be a part of it. I would love to see you in person on Wednesday. For now, we're here to worship God. We're here to experience the transfiguration of Jesus. Let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship. Good morning. Our first reading is from the Second Kings, verse chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's a little confusing because both Elijah and her, his son Elisha are featured. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophet who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. Elijah said to him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me as far as Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. <clears throat> the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know. Hold your peace. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went, and they stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see it, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, <clears throat> behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And he saw them no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and rent them to pieces. The second reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 
2 through 9. And after the six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. <coughs> And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus alone. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've been reading a novel called Missionaries by the National Book Award winning author Phil Clay. The book shows how four people from different places around the world, living very different lives and fighting very different wars in the Middle East and in South America, are brought into devastating contact with each other by modern technology and global politics. I promise not to give you a book report about this. I only mention it because I had such mixed feelings about some scenes in the novel. The author is a Marine Corps veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've read there is a paradox in modern warfare. Technology like missiles and drones put distance between the action itself and the decision makers in command. And a side effect of all this progress is that targets are dehumanized and the experience of war becomes very impersonal even to those who are most intimately involved. Aside from those technical advances, it's hard for the public to remember that it's fighting a war if the fighting is always on someone else's land. So Phil Clay writes with vivid, I would even say repulsive detail to convey the consequences of war to an American public that is largely unbothered by our government's habitual engagement in conflict. I won't describe the scenes. I'll just say that reading this, I couldn't stand to watch what I was seeing. But neither could I look away. We all know what it feels like to watch when what you're seeing has a certain hold on you. It might have something to do with fear. You know, to be frozen. Like a child seeing illusions of figures in the dark when the lights have been turned out. Just close your eyes and go to sleep, the exhausted parents want to say. But the child knows that she's got to stay watchful and alert in case monsters come out from under the bed. Watching, not because we like what we see, but because it's too dangerous to turn away? Well, that explains much of our collective experience in recent years, doesn't it? 
The advice we give our children is not too easy to take ourselves. If we had just turned it off or closed our eyes or, or turned away, recent calamities might well have been handled quite differently. And this is sort of the experience of Elisha, the prophet, watching with his chin on the floor as his elder, Elijah, is swooped up into the whirlwind. He can't stop looking at this event because this event will change his life and the collective life of his people. He is heartsick with worry about the future. As Elijah's chariot disappears into the clouds, Elisha rends his garments in pain. He picks up the mantle that Elijah left for him and he returns to his people who are equally perplexed. They cannot believe what they saw. Literally, they are in disbelief. So powerful is their denial that Elijah is actually gone that they insist that the cloud that took him away must have dropped him someplace just over the horizon. Please, we have 50 strong men. Send them, they say. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught Elijah up and dropped him down on some mountain or down in some valley. Like in the Wizard of Oz, they reason that the whirlwind must have set that house down somewhere. But this is no fantasy film. The book of Kings has a narrative and a voice and an agenda, let's be sure. But it is also a primary source historical document. We're reading about people who are trying to make sense of the events that they record. We saw the whole thing. In fact, we watched with rapt attention. But what we saw was so baffling that we're not so sure now that we really saw what we thought we saw. This, of course, is just the Old Testament version of a story that famously turns up in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and Jesus was transfigured before them. The New Testament draws heavily on the older tradition of the Hebrew Bible, especially on our memories of Moses on the mountaintop, another sight that bewildered all the witnesses. And witnesses report even that Elijah was himself present at the transfiguration of Jesus. But aside from these characters, other allusions are strong too. The fire and the light, the bright white robe, the cloud, the whirlwind, the voice from heaven, it's all here. What's different is that the witnesses relate to the experience differently. Whereas Elisha and his people could not turn away from the whirlwind that they saw take Elijah away, Luke says that Jesus had to keep nudging his disciples so that they would stay awake. Mark's narrative is sparser in detail. What he suggests is not that the disciples fell asleep, but that they blinked and they missed it. These events are so dramatic that we must be wondering, how could they help but pay attention? Like, how could you possibly fall asleep in Jurassic Park, the movie? How could you sleep through a fireworks show? Does anybody fall asleep at a monster truck rally? No. But I guess zoning out is a coping mechanism too, isn't it? Even things that scare us, we can treat as so commonplace that we hardly notice them anymore. I think that's why Phil Clay has written such a horrifying book about war in the 21st century. For two-thirds of my life, my country has been involved in wars that on most days I am in genuine danger of forgetting. I think a lot about 9-11, how I watched it on TV with rapt attention, like Elisha and his people wrestling with their denial, knowing that these events would change our lives forever. 
Yet over time, my senses have been dulled and very infrequently am I asked to be anything other than oblivious. It must be so hard to be a veteran, to live among the few who have watched with Elisha the whirlwind, a whirlwind that others would just as soon forget. It makes me think of that bumper sticker I sometimes see or um, that meme that pops up on social media. If you're not angry, you aren't paying attention. And that feels convicting to me. There is so much suffering throughout the world and even just around me that, that I make a daily habit of compartmentalizing it away just so I can function. I feel bad about pushing it away sometimes. I feel some guilt that all my privilege protects me from a lot of pain. And yet, it is also true that there's a lot of pain in my story that others know nothing about. Just as I'm sure there is such pain in yours. And yet, it's also true that it's not possible to live in outrage all the time. None of us have the power to resolve all the suffering that we see. Often the best we can do is take stock of the privilege that we have. The privilege that gives us whatever protection that we enjoy. And then... With some self-understanding and self-awareness, then we can cry out to God in confession and lamentation. But this is not a God. Ask Elisha or Jesus. This is not a God who ever promised an end to our pain or anyone else's. Let's be specific about what God has promised. Fullness of life abundance of grace, faithfulness in love. So Elisha turns from the whirlwind and rejoins his people. Jesus descends from the cloud and embraces his disciples and accompanies them back down the mountain. So I do believe that God sometimes gives us an Elisha moment that will hold our attention. Maybe God actually boggles our minds because there's something humbling that we need to see. And surely there are also moments where the love of Christ reaches into our experience and wakes us up. Maybe then we are left with some disbelief. Maybe then we are seized with fear. Maybe then we are carrying some anger. Cannot each of these things, if not remedied, then be held in love? These things that God has promised, life, grace, love, they are not always a cure or a resolution. But they may be what each of us has the power within us to give. A touch, a presence, a simple offering. May you be blessed with the Spirit of God. A spirit of life and grace, and love. Amen. Yeah.
We want to remind you that many of our prayer requests are listed in the bulletin information that is sent from the church office each week. We also invite you to share any prayer requests that you have in the comments on Facebook. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we hear the story of Elisha and Elijah we hear the story of Elisha clinging to the presence of Elijah. I will not leave you, he says. And his request in the end is for a double share of Elijah's spirit. This is something of holy mystery. And we hear the story of Peter and James and John on the mountaintop with Jesus and they cling to this mountaintop experience, to the holy mystery of the transfiguration of Jesus. Let us be shaped by these stories as we pray together. God, in whom we live and move and have our very being, we give thanks and praise for thin places, for the opportunity to be touched by holy mystery, for holy whirlwinds which sweep us off our feet, for coming near to the dazzling mystical Christ, for the gift of spirit, of the Holy Spirit which sustains us, and compels us and binds us to each other. God, we plead for company and comfort in the quiet stillness that we often occupy when the whirlwind has passed. As we descend from the mountaintop into the valley, even as we walk through the valley, teach us to fear no evil. As we navigate steep climbs and steep descents, as we walk lonely roads, as we bask in joy and grieve the loss of those whom we love, strengthen us. Teach us to be transformed in the presence of the holy. And teach us, God, to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved people of God, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.